Hi everyone, welcome to Must Read Monday. My name is Dabney. I'm the Young Adult Librarian with the Twin Lakes Libraries and I use they, them pronouns. For today's episode, we are going to be going through books in the collection that are by or about Native Americans. And this is for Native American Heritage Month. So I have kind of set myself a personal challenge to read all of them this month. I had a little bit of a head start because I'd read some of them, but not all. And I've you know, been working towards that goal steadily since November started, and I'm excited to share these books with you. First up, we have the nonfiction books, Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask by Anton Troyer. This is the Young Readers Edition. So I actually did start reading this and then found out that there's the audiobook on Libby. So I also checked it out there and listened to it um, over the weekend while I was doing a bunch of stuff. And then I'd, you know, stop periodically, flip through the book, and look at, you know, whatever pictures there were. Um, and then kind of like resume listening. So this is... A lot of information it's told in like question and answer format but it all flows together really seamlessly I thought it was really understand like really easy to understand really engaging um, I learned a ton and it, it was just really a really great read like I highly recommend this I really think that everyone should read it um, and I like that you know it starts out the first section, it's like divided into sections. Um, the first section is terminology, which is great. Like that's kind of, you know, one of the initial questions you might have, which um, it says, what general terms are most appropriate for talking about North, American, North America's first people? And um, the author goes on to say that in Canada, um, you would refer to the people there um, as First Nations. Um, and it says, to clarify the distinct identities of the Inuit and Matisse in Canada, First Nation was not applied to the Inuit or Matisse because only those formally officially called Indian in Canada. Um, and then he goes on to talk about like in America, there's not this kind of general consensus on terminology. And he said that in this book, he uses the terms Indian, Native, Native American, and Indigenous um, intentionally and with full knowledge of their shortcomings and the risk that some of them are confusing or even give some people offense. So um, he also goes on to say, because terminology is not settled, even Natives can't agree on a word to use. I also recommend that young people or just, you know, old people like me, Initiate discussion with their peers and schools about appropriate labels, especially if you have indigenous friends and classmates. Um, so yes, um, and then he goes on to talk about what terms are not appropriate for talking about North America's first people, um, talking about specific tribes, and then gets into other sections, um, history, culture, religion, um, Activism, it's like really kind of, yeah, every every question you might think of. Um, so I just kind of went straight through this at once, but you know, you could always just, you know, if you had specific questions, look them up. Um, there's a really great, I'm such a nerd, I'm like, there's a great index in the back and notes and, um, you know, recommended reading, all of that stuff. So I think this is very good. Um, the audiobook is like eight hours long, so it's not, you know, well, to me, I'm like, that's not really that long. So <laughs> check it out. Um, next up, we have What the Eagle Sees, Indigenous Stories of Rebellion and Renewal. And I read this yesterday, um, like afternoon, evening, and it didn't really take me that long. This one, um, has color illustrations and maps and like the format it it's kind of got this very like visually appealing format it really condenses information down 
Um, and it, you know, a lot of stuff that's covered in here is covered in the other book. However, it does get into um, some, like, different individual stories. There's more, like, there's a little bit more of a focus on Canada, um, where the authors are from. And there's also little sections, um, you know, imagine sections, where it's kind of trying to put you into the perspective of the indigenous people um, and the, you know, experience they're going through. Um, and so this book, the authors do refer to native peoples as indigenous. So just keep that in mind as a, you know, as the other book mentioned, terminology, different people use different terms. But yeah, I thought this was, you know, short, engaging, informative, and it's kind of like a good stepping off point. Um, I haven't read this one yet. It is Undefeated Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indian School football team. Um, Jim Thorpe did come up in a couple of the books I've read since I started this. So he is a, well, let me read you the back. So, by the way, the author of this is not Native American, but he's like one of the leading authors of young adult nonfiction. He's written a lot of really great books. Um, okay, the true story of, quote, the team that invented football. When Jim Thorpe and, Thorpe and Pop Warner met in 1907 at the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, they forged one of the winningest teams in the history of America's favorite sport. Called the team that invented football, Carlisle's innovative squad challenged the greatest, most elite teams, Harvard, Yale, Army, audaciously vowing to take their place among the nation's football powers. This is an astonishing underdog sports story and more. It's an unflinching look at the U.S. government's violent persecution of Native Americans and the school that was designed to erase Indian cultures. It's the story of a group of young men who came together at that school, the overwhelming obstacles they faced both on and off the field, and their absolute refusal to accept defeat. Okay, so I haven't read this one yet, but I am, I do know a little bit about Jim Thorpe and his story, but I know from reading these other books more about um, the practice of removing Native American children from their families and homes and sending them to um, either mission schools or boarding schools, um, which is like, it was a really terrible practice because at the schools, not only were the children often subject to abuse and neglect and malnutrition, but when they got there, you know, they were stripped of all their, you know, the traditional clothing they were wearing, that was taken from them, their hair was shaved off, they were made to, it was basically forced assimilation, um, you know, being made to conform to this white ideal of how people should be, um, and it, it was awful, it was awful, and lots, lots of children died, um, and the ones who, you know, did survive, you know, they're sent home, and they were told, like, you know, you're going to be trained to be able to work in, like, the white workforce, essentially, and they go home, and that doesn't happen. They don't get those jobs they were promised. Um, they're back living with families on the reservation and feeling like they don't belong there anymore. Um, and feeling this disconnect. Um, one of the things that was done um, was forcing the children to speak English only. They were like severely punished for speaking their own language and that led to um, like a community loss of language and culture that um, at least from the books I've been reading, you know, Native Americans are still you know, trying to recover from that. So, yes, lots, lots of trauma from that time period. And honestly, it didn't stop that long ago. Um, it was, I can't remember when it exactly stopped in the United States, but I feel like in Canada it was going on through the 70s. Um, so this is not, like, way, way back in the day. You know, this, this book, it says, you know, it's set 1907. That was, like... A little over 100 years ago, not that long ago. So yeah, um, I haven't read this yet, but I will. So 
you want to read it, check it out. Up next, we have Pocahontas by Joseph Ruschak, and I haven't read this one yet either, but he is one of like the leading, um, like one of the most well-known Native American authors, especially for like youth literature. He writes um, children's books and middle grades and young adult, um, and I have like some of his Anyways, I have some of his books on hold that I haven't read yet, and so I will get to this one eventually, but let me just read you the little flap, because the Pocahontas story, if you saw Disney and you're like, I know the, I know the story, which, I'll be honest, when I was a kid growing up, I thought I knew the story, but then you find out that was not the story, that was Disney. Um, in 1607, when John Smith and his coatman arrived in Powhatan, sorry for my pronunciation, to begin settling the colony of Virginia, the relations with the village and inha village's inhabitants are anything but warm. Pocahontas, the beloved daughter of Powhatan chief, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, don't know how to pronounce this, um, is just 11, but despite her age, this astute young girl acts with wisdom and compassion and plays a fateful, peaceful role in the destinies of two people. Drawing from personal journals of John Smith, Joseph Bruchak, winner of the American Book Award, revealed an important part of history through the eyes of two historic figures. One thing I've learned just from, like, I did start this. I read a few pages and then didn't have time to get too far into it. But, um, like, Pocahontas, I think, was 11 or 12 when she had, like, first contact um, with John Smith, which, you know, if you've watched the movie, that's not <laughs> what you thought. So anyways, these are the nonfiction books um, we have in the collection, and then I'll also have a link so you can look at, like, what's available through Hoopla as well, because there's more books. Um, now we're going to jump into fiction. First off, we have The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie. Um, this one I did read um, quite a bit ago. Junior is a budding cartoonist growing up on the Spokane Indian Reservation. Born with a variety of medical problems, he is picked on by everyone but his best friend. Determined to receive a good education, Junior leaves the res to attend an all-white school in the neighbor neighboring farm town, where the only other Indian is the school mascot. Despite being condemned as a traitor to his people and enduring great tragedies, Junior attacks life with wit and humor and discovers a strength inside himself that he never knew existed. Inspired by his own experiences growing up, award-winning author Sherman Alexie chronicles the contemporary adolescence of one unlucky boy trying to rise above the life everyone expects him to live. Um, so it's been a minute since I've read this, but I do remember, you know, there's the cartoons throughout and it's really funny um and oof, there's a lot going on in this book um, it's another picture so yes this is one of like the probably most one of the more um known books um in young adult literature about native americans by native american author so then we've got Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Foley, and this is one I listened to recently. If you're like, Dami, you listen to too many audiobooks, it's true. That's how I read so much. I listen to audiobooks all the time. Um, this one is large. Okay. 18 year old Donna Fontaine has never quite fit in, both in her hometown and on the nearby by Ojibwe Reservation. She dreams of a fresh start at college, but when family tragedy start, strikes, Donis puts her future on hold to look after her fragile mother. The only bright spot is meeting Jamie, the charming new recruit on her brother Levi's hockey team. Even as Donis falls for Jamie, she senses the dashing hockey star is hiding something. Everything comes to light when Donis witnesses a shocking murder, thrusting her into an FBI investigation of a lethal new drug. 
Reluctantly, Donis agrees to go undercover, drawing on her knowledge of chemistry and Ojibwe traditional medicine to track down the source. But the search for truth is more complicated than Donis imagined, exposing secrets and old scars. At the same time, she grows concerned with an investigation that seems more focused on punishing the offenders than protecting the victims. Now, as the deceptions and deaths keep growing, Donna's must learn what it means to be a strong Anishinaabwe, um, key Ojibwe woman, and how far she's, she'll go for her community, even if it tears apart the only world she's ever known. Firekeeper's Daughter is an electric, electrifying thriller layered with a rich exploration of the modern Native experience, a reckoning of current and historical injustices, and a powerful celebration of community. Yes, it is all of those things. Um, so reading this, before I read these nonfiction books, I was being introduced to a lot of concepts I was not aware of. Um, and so, you know, in the book, the author does a good job of like unpacking those things um, and like explaining them within the narrative of the story. And then, um, when I read the nonfiction books, I got a chance to learn more about it. Um, there's a cat outside the library. I just thought y'all should know. It's so cute. And it looks lost. Um, I'm sorry. I see a cat and I have to say something. Uh, yeah, so this one gets into like tribal enrollment and blood quantum and, you know, heritage and parentage and um, what it means to like be a mixed race Native American. Um, it kind of gets into like a whole lot of facets of Indian life um, because, you know, Donis doesn't um, live on the reservation, but she has family on the reservation. So she's kind of like on this edge between two worlds and trying to navigate them both. Um, while also trying to solve, you know, who's bringing these, like, lethal drugs into her community, um, and dealing with a bunch of other stuff going on, like, a lot of stuff. So, I, I really think this is a great read. Um, it might be more for, like, older teens, so, like, if, you know, if you have, because it does deal with, like, a lot of heavy stuff, so just, you know, keep that in mind when you want to read it. But I thought it was fantastic. Um, I'm looking forward to more by this author. So very good. All right. I listened to this one last week, Code Talker by Joseph Bruchak, a novel about the Navajo Marines in World War II. The United States is at war, and 16-year-old Ned Begay wants to join the cause, especially when he hears that Navajos are being specifically recruited by the Marine Corps. So he claims he's old enough to enlist, breezes his way through boot camp, and suddenly finds himself involved in a top-secret task, one that's exclusively performed by Navajos. He has become a code talker. His experiences in the Pacific from Guadalcanal to Iwo Jima and beyond will forever change him. Throughout World War II and the conflict fought against Japan, Navajo code talkers were a crucial part of the U.S. effort, sending messages back and forth in an unbreakable code that used their native language. They braved some of the heaviest fighting of the war, and with their code, they saved countless American lives. Yet their story remained classified for more than 20 years. When the war ended, they weren't able to tell anyone, not even their families, about their true contribution. But we now know their amazing stories, and Joseph Bruchak brings them to life through the riveting fictional tale of Ned Begay. His grueling journey is eye-opening and inspiring. Code Talker honors all of those young men, like Ned, who dared to serve. It honors the culture and language of the, Na of the Navajo Indians, and it speaks eloquently about the brutal realities of battle. It is a de deeply affecting novel and a terribly important one. So yes, even though this is about, you know, a, f a fictional character. Um, Joseph Bruchak did a ton of research, um, which he talks about in the author note, um, preparing for this story. Um, he's got a selected bibliography in the back, um, as well as 
you know, more books you can read. And I kind of like, you know, knew vaguely about the Navajo Code Talkers, but this really got into more about um, how they created the code and then their experience and, you know, serving, in this case, serving in the Marines as, you know, a Native American. Um, it starts out, even though, you know, this is fictional, but the main character starts out, you know, being sent to a mission school and going through um, the assimilation process that I talked about earlier of having, you know, his clothing and jewelry removed, having his head shaved, being forced to wear, you know, these uniforms and only speak English and being, like, beaten if he spoke, you know, Navajo. Um, so, you know, it is, you know, you're reading it, and for me, I kind of felt like, First, I was like, why, if you have been this mistreated by the U.S. government, would you want to serve? Um, but, you know, they get into how this, you know, Ned and the other um, Navajo he's serving with are like, you know, this is our land. Um, this is our country, and we want to fight and defend it sort of in the tradition of Navajo warriors. Um, so, yeah, it was, like, it was an interesting perspective. It, I learned a lot, you know, it's fictional, but at the same time, very deeply rooted in facts. So um, I thought it was really engaging, really well, well written, easy to understand. Um, and like, I listened to the audiobook and it was like five hours, so you can do it. It's also pretty short. This video is getting so long, I'm sorry. Haven't read this one yet. Joseph Ruchak again, as I said, he's written a lot of books. Killer of Enemies, this is first book of a trilogy. It's um, sort of like a sci-fi story. Okay. This is not a once upon a time story. Years ago, 17-year-old Apache hunter Lazen and her family lived in a world of haves and have-nots. There were the ones, people so augmented with technology and genetic enhancements that they were barely human, and there was everyone else who served them. Then the cloud came and everything changed. Tech stopped working, the world plunged back into a new steam age. The one's pets, genetically engineered monsters, turned on them and are now loose on the world. Fate has given Lawson a unique set of survival skills and magical abilities that she uses to take down monsters for the remaining ones who have kidnapped her family. But with every monster she kills, Lawson's powers grow and she connects those powers to an ancient legend of her people. It soon becomes clear to Lazen that she is meant to be more than a hired gun hunter. Lazen is meant to be a hero. So I'm really looking forward to reading these books. Um, they sound, yeah, really unique, and I love sci-fi, so I'm going to get into it. Uh, I love this book. I think I've talked about it multiple times. A Lots Away by Darcy Little Badger, who has a new book. Um, coming out this month, I believe it's, um, I'm going to look it up real fast, because it's something, I think it's like a snake fell to earth, we'll find out. Sorry, if you can hear the bells, it means it's noon, and they're ringing. A Snake Falls to Earth. I was right. It comes out this month. We're going to be getting it into the collection. I can't wait. Um, this was one of, you know, my favorite books um, from last year. Imagine an America very similar to our own. It's got homework, best friends, and pistachio ice cream. There are some differences. This America has been shaped dramatically by the magic, monsters, knowledge, and legends of its peoples, those indigenous and those not. Some of these forces are charmingly everyday, like the ability to make an orb of light appear or travel across the world through rings of fungi. But other forces are less charming and should never see the light of day. Elatsue lives in this slightly stranger America. She can raise the ghost of dead animals, a skill passed on through generations of her Lapin Apache family. Her beloved cousin has just been murdered in a town that wants no crying eyes. But she's going to do more than pry. The picture-perfect facade of Willoughby masks gruesome secrets, and she will rely on her wits, skills, and friends to tear off the mask and protect her family. 
Um, so yes, this is really great. And also, like, the main character is asexual, which just made me really... I love it. I love it. Um, and the illustrations within are gorgeous, really capturing, like, the vibe of the book. So it's like, you know, ghost friends. Like, um, a lots of ways, like, dog died, sadly, but then she was able to, like, raise his ghost, and he's kind of like her you know, shadow protecting her and stuff. This is really good. Okay, then we've got Hearts Unbroken by um, Cynthia Littich Smith. Sorry. And I am currently reading this one. I'm about a third of the way in. I'm really enjoying it. So, you know, we've kind of talked about um, some stuff that's like kind of hard-hitting, realistic, we've talked about historical, we've talked about sci-fi, we talked about fantasy, now we get some contemporary. Um, Louise's first real boyfriend is Alpha Jot Cam. He can be romantic, charismatic, but over time he reveals himself as an ego, egomaniacal and sensitive jerk. When he mocks and disrespects native people, Louise finally had enough. Besides, she's happier with her intertribal community, her best friend Shelby, and working on the school newspaper. And, no, it doesn't hurt that the editors have paired her with Joey, the ambitious new photo-video staffer who's faced relationship woes of his own. In no time, Lou and Joey find themselves tackling the story of the year. The school's musical director takes an inclusive approach to casting The Wizard of Oz, and runs into backlash from the newly formed Parents Against Revisionist Theater. Spreading hostility breeds anonymous threats, blackmail, and bullying. Targets include teachers, parents, students, and most of all, the cast members at the center of the controversy, including Lou's little brother, who's playing a tin man. As the conflict heats up, so does a romance between Lou and Joey. But it's complicated, emotionally risky. Dating, white, dating while native, in their mostly white, middle-class suburb. And trying to protect her own heart, will Lou break Joey's and miss out on true love? I'll find out, because I'm still reading this. But I'm really enjoying it so far. Um, it's very good. And it also, like, you know, they're tackling lots of issues um, in this book, but still kind of weaving in, like, everyday high school drama, I guess, and life. Um, so I'm, I think it's, it's really good. And so, yeah, if you're looking for a good contemporary read, I would recommend Hearts Unbroken. All right, and last of all, we've got a couple um, graphic novels. So we've got Surviving the City, Volume 1. I did read this. It's very small. Um, there's more volumes, so I'm hoping to get those in. Um, and this one is set in Canada. Um, And I'm really sorry about my pronunciation, y'all. I'm trying. Um, Mikawan and Des are best friends. Together, the teens navigate the challenges of growing up indigenous in the city. They're so close, they even... Hold on one second. All right, sorry for that brief interruption. Okay, so they are so close, they even completed their very fast together. When Des's grandmother becomes too sick, Des can't stay with her anymore. With the threats of a group home looming, Des can't bring herself to go home and disappears. McCowan is devastated, and the wound of her missing mother resurfaces. Will Des's community find her before it's too late? Will McCowan be able to cope if they don't? Um, and so yes, this one um, is good about some like hard-hitting real issues happening in Canberra. Uh, regarding like missing indigenous women. So. Okay, next up we have this place, 150 years retold, um, and this is explore the past 150 years through the eyes of indigenous creators in this groundbreaking graphic novel anthology. Um, Let's see, beautifully illustrated, these 10 stories are an emotional and enlightening journey through indigenous wonder works, serial killings, psychic battles, and time travel. See how indigenous people have survived a post-apocalyptic world since contact. 
haven't read this yet, but I want to. Um, this is another one that was like published in Canada. And it's, you know, got different creators, different writers, different artists. Um, but I am hoping to get to this one this month. So, put this on your to read list. So, yeah, those are the books in our collection. Um, there are more in the online collections. Um, then, you know, there's also like middle grades and adult authors, you know if you're comfortable like branching out um like rebecca roanhorse is an adult author who i've read um you know sh her books are really good like sci-fi fantasy um there's one author i want to um listen to his book i saw it on hoopla i'd heard about it i think last year um, James Byrd, The Brave, I think he has another one either that's come out or is coming out, and it's like a middle grade novel, but it sounded really good to me. Um, so yeah, those are our books. Um, I hope you can check them out, read them, um, and yeah, have a good week, um, and tune in Wednesday because we will have a craft video then. Um, yeah, talk to y'all later. Bye!